Hi, I'm Jeffrey Banks. I'm co-curating with Patricia Mears the exhibition Norman Norell, Dean of American Fashion. And I've also just finished a book which will be coming out this spring, Norman Norell, Master of American Fashion. Since I was a child, I've always loved Norman Norell's work. Even before I knew who the man was, when I saw the clothes, there was something about the classic nature and the beautiful workmanship of the clothing that really excited me. Norman Norell really brought a new standard of excellence to American ready-to-wear. Although Norell had very high-end customers wearing his clothes, the clothes were, in fact, ready-to-wear. They could only be purchased from stores, but he took these couture techniques. I, I think Norman Norell was, was, was absolutely, against his wishes, the first superstar and I think people were in awe of him. I watched one of, of his classes at, at Parsons, and it was like the, the president, the emperor, walked in. I don't think the industry understood him in the beginning at all. Everything was Paris. The stores were geared toward Paris. Chic women wore Parisian clothes. He suddenly understood that there was a woman there who had a different body type, who wanted clothing that was made well, both outside and inside. I think if you went back in the DNA, you would find that in American fashion, he was one of the original roots. He was born in 1900 in Noblesville, Indiana, Norman Levinson. He changed his name when he came to New York. He took the Nor from Norman, the L from Levinson, and added an extra L for luck, as he said. His father was a haberdasher, and he would take him to Keith's Vaudeville, and Norman was fascinated with the stagecraft, the dazzle of sequins and payats, and that love of the theater led him to come to New York to go to Pratt to study fashion design and illustration, and uh, initially to work for movie houses, uh, in particular Paramount Pictures, when Paramount Pictures decided to move to California, Norman d decided that he wanted to stay in New York. And then he went to work for Hattie Carnegie. Hattie Carnegie was an incredible entrepreneur. She was not a designer, but she was an immigrant who came from Poland. When she came through Ellis Island and the customs official asked her name, she asked, who is the richest man in America? and the customs official said, Andrew Carnegie, and she said, that's my last name. Her clientele was uh, really the, the best of uh, Park Avenue. Norman going to work for her in 1928 as part of her stable of designers. He quickly rose to be the head designer, and he really honed his craft at Hattie Carnegie. Also, Hattie Carnegie went to Paris twice a year, and she bought usually 200 numbers from all the houses. And by taking the clothes apart, Norell really learned about technique. This was a great education for him. And he did it for almost 13 years. A very well-known manufacturer of very high-end clothes, Anthony Trena, was invited to meet Norell. Trena said, now listen, I would like to hire you, but if you want your name on the label, I'm gonna pay you less money. And Norell said, I want my name on the label. So the label was Trina Norell. And uh, in doing this, with all the fashion editors and buyers, Norell really became very well known. During this period of time with Trina, he really um, sort of honed his craft. Neiman Marcus, Bergdorf Goodman, Saks Fifth Avenue, they all began to recognize that he was one of the best designers on 7th Avenue, and he started to win a lot of awards. He was the first designer to win the Cody Award in the early 40s. Uh, he was also one of the first presidents of the CFDA, the Council of Fashion Designers of America. One of the things that I think was really pivotal with him was when Anthony Train in 1959 decides that he is going to retire with a couple of silent investors. He bought out Anthony Trena, and for the first time at 60 years of age, the label read Norman Norell, New York. 
I think he had this huge burst of creativity because for the first time, he was able to do whatever he wanted to do. And I think from that point, from 1960 to 1972, when he, when he died, I think was his most creative output. There were several codes that Norell did over and over and over again. When he found a silhouette, when he found an idea that he loved, he did it. Uh, one of the things beside me uh, that he's probably most famous for were the mermaid dresses. These were sequin sheaths. The sequins were sewn on by hand and they were sewn in such a way that they actually moved and undulated on the fabric, usually silk jersey. Norell was such a perfectionist that he went to Paris to have his sequins made. He would go with the fabric and he would go to the sequin maker and he would wait for three days until samples of the uh, metal that was made into the sequins was dyed to make sure that it matched exactly the chiffon or the silk jersey. One of the codes of, of, of Norell's design uh, was the sailor suit. Uh, as a child, he wore a sailor suit that was actually one of the first ready-to-wear uh, garments made for children. It was made by a company called Peter Thompson in 1901. This sort of stuck with him, and as you can see, he uh, reinterpreted it, that throughout his career. One of the things that uh, Norell always insisted upon was that the clothes had to work for a woman's life. One of the things he did that was incredibly innovative in 1960 was he invented culottes. He said women lead modern lives. They get in and out of cars, they get in and out of subways. Um, I want to create a divided skirt for them that looks like a skirt, but actually functions like pants. And the customers actually loved it. This was really, really kind of very forward thinking for a guy who was um, not a young designer at that, at that point. I think that Norman Norell, because his father was a haberdasher, he loved tailoring. He loved the influence of menswear. And when he did a tailored jacket, uh, as part of a suit, a skirt suit or a pants suit. It was made as beautifully as anything you would buy on Savile Row. Norell's favorite period of, of fashion was the 1920s. He was in his 20s, in the 20s. I think uh, because his career was just starting then, he was very excited about fashion. Norell harked back to the 20s very often. Um, and this was really most apparent when he did uh, wool jersey. Norell loved color. Um, he was really uh, a master at color. Norell liked bright, bold, brash colors. He also liked murky, off colors. He loved color blocking. Oftentimes it was with sequins. Uh, and, and wool crepe or wool jersey, but he was doing bold brash color before lots of other designers. In the simplicity of the clothes, it made them stand out. If you wore a Norell garment like this, you walked in a room, you didn't need a fur coat. My name is Ralph Rucci, and it's a great honor to be a part of the project. If you take the word perfection and you dissect it, it becomes a series of images of the particular cuts that you would see within the clothes. The perfection of an armhole, the perfection of a shoulder line. He held a pencil in terms of finding the most perfect line, and he did in each garment. Norell worked alone. There weren't students, there weren't assistants. Every bit of every process was perfection. Silence, I think, pertains to all of our great gods of fashion. If you have a certain vocabulary, when the viewer looks at the clothes, you feel and you hear the silence. You were part of the level of taste and connoisseurship that Norell was offering in the collection. For Norman Norell, no detail was too small, whether it was a button, whether it was the fabrication, whether it was the lining. 
a Norel coat was incredibly interlined in the most extraordinary super silk organza. The hems were then all buckramed or hymo canvassed on the bias, and then the taffeta silk linings were all hand set in. And what more silence is there when you see those hand stitches? You almost recall or understand the moment when all that is being done. I mean, look at this pocket. It actually curves over the hip. It's not a straight line. I mean, that's the kind of detail that is so quintessentially Norell. When you see a Norman Norell coat, it's got the right amount of buttons. It's got the right proportions. It's level-headed. And yet, at the same time, it's romantic. It's a hard thing to achieve in clothing. One of the things I loved about Norell was that his daytime clothes were as dramatic and beautiful and sophisticated as his evening clothes. Most designers are known for one thing or the other. The client that uh, people know the best is Lauren Bacall. Lena Horne wore his clothes. First ladies from Michelle Obama who wore vintage Norell in 2010 to um, Lady Bird Johnson, Jacqueline Onassis, uh, Pat Nixon, Doris Day wore his clothes in That Touch of Me. Uh, all the clothes you wore in the movie are, are Norman Norell. You could wear almost anything in that fashion show section today. Um, and that's what people really loved about his clothes. The takeaway for the exhibit is going to be, I think, timelessness and the simplicity of a few elements creating a mountain of possibilities. I want young people to know who Norman Norell was and how important he was. For so many years, we felt that the only good fashion came out of Europe, but Norell's clothes could equal anybody else's clothes. I really don't want people to forget him because I think his clothes were exquisite and he deserves to be remembered.